Good afternoon, Radford fans, and welcome to another edition of Sports Talk with Rags here in Season 4, Episode 18. And today here we have Radford baseball alum and author Ron Peterson Jr. Ron, how are you doing today? Doing good, Mark. Good to be with you. Hey, appreciate uh, you coming on and uh, appreciate through uh, Denny and uh, Mike Ashley. Uh, appreciate uh, them uh, giving me the recommendation to uh, connect with you. Got some tough acts to follow. I've seen some of the other guys you've had on and uh, I'm not not near the ball players they were. Right. Well, hey, I appreciate your time and let's uh, let's start at the beginning. I mean, I know uh, there with uh, talking over the phone that uh, you grew up in the uh, on the peninsula and so being part of uh, Bethel Bethel baseball, uh, did you play any other sports uh, growing up or was it just baseball? Yeah, when I, when I was young, played them all, you know, played football, basketball, uh, wrestled a little bit. But, you know, in through high school, baseball was, was kind of my main sport then and, and the sport I played at Bethel. Right. Yeah, the, um, I guess the thing I remember most, you know, about high school on the, the peninsula, you know, the the beach district always got a lot of attention, you know, had a lot, a lot of good ball players. But, um, you know, certainly back then, the, the early, mid 80s, you know, the, the time period I was around some some really good baseball on the peninsula. Some good players came through. A lot of a lot of Division One players and quite a few guys I played with that were drafted. Okay, yeah. And so with um, let's see, and then once uh, Bethel, uh, once high school was uh, was done, then I mean, did you look to see where you could play at the next level, or with uh, you know, or with applying to Radford and their baseball program just starting? Yeah, um, I was coming out of high school, I'd say, and, you know, most people I played with would probably tell you it was sort of just an average to good player. And, uh, you know, wasn't recruited by any Division I schools, had spoken with a few Division Three coaches. And, you know, back then, that kind of the pitch was just, yeah, hey, you know, hey, come on out. You know, there's a tryout in the fall. And um, but um, went uh, actually my first year out of high school, went to junior college, went to uh, Ferrum at the time was a junior You're college. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so back back in that area, there were really three good junior colleges. A lot of kids from Virginia or Hampton Roads would go to, you know, Ferrum, Lewisburg, which is still around. And then also Chawan. Oh, yeah. Uh, typically, you know, a lot of guys, maybe there were some guys who didn't quite have the grades in high school to play at Division One school or uh, they weren't recruited or, you know, in my case, I, I was hoping that I was a late bloomer. Right. You know, you uh, physically just was not a real mature kid coming out of high school. You know, you look around and the guys typically that are that are playing at a, at a high level or getting drafted, you know, are guys physically a lot more more uh, mature and developed. So um, anyway, went to went to Ferrum and the, the coach then. Uh, and again, it was a junior college. Ferrum, as you know, is a Division three school now. Right. Um, Coach in was a guy up and comer by the name of Rick Jones, okay. uh, first college coaching job. He went on to Elon and then to Georgia Tech as a pitching coach and then was at Tulane later on in the 90s and took Tulane to the College World Series and oh, wow. you know, at the, at, at one, one of the great coaches. But anyway, was there for a year and um, then then heard that uh, that Radford was starting a baseball program. Um right. Uh, Radford was this this growing school, you know, growing college and, and going through a lot of uh, a lot of expansion. And they wanted to be Division One in athletics. They played men's and women's basketball, especially, you know, where they were really competitive around the state. And uh, the Big South Conference, which they're still in, was just forming at that point. And part of the deal, if they wanted to join, they needed to add a sport. And the easy sport for them to add was baseball. Um, right. As far as I, I understood, they made that decision in 1984, and uh, the program came together really quickly. And and um, you know maybe maybe even without a, by necessity without a lot of planning um, that they were going to field a team in the spring of '85, and that you know that was when when I transferred. Right. Uh, and uh, can tell you if you want to go down that road, I'll tell you some uh, yeah. interesting stuff about the state of the program that first year, and certainly. <laughs> challenges we had right yeah and uh, look looking up i mean uh you know some of the some of the teams that are still part of the big south i mean winthrop radford unc Asheville, uh charleston southern 
you know, Campbell and Coastal were original members, but, you know, Campbell's recently gone to the CAA and Coastal there with the Sun Belt, but their last day as a member of the Big South, they they won the national championship. <laughs> they sure did. Yeah, we uh, we we played Coastal a doubleheader. Um, something I'll never forget, their coach was a guy named Bobby Richardson, who's uh, a yeah. uh, New York Yankees Hall of Famer. He was a second baseman on the good Yankee World Series teams back in the 50s and 60s, you know, right. played with with Mickey Mantle. In fact, he gave the eulogy at Mickey Mantle's funeral. Right. And just a just a great guy. And that your Coastal Carolina's catcher was a guy named Kurt Manwaring. Oh, yeah. A player, as I saw, he uh, won a gold glove with the San Francisco Giants, played with the Giants and the Padres. And uh, for a period of years, he was probably one of the best defensive catchers in baseball. Didn't hit a lot at that level, but he sure did in college. Hit the hit a hit a couple of home runs against us in a doubleheader. Yeah. Well, I know that you uh, definitely uh, shared with me here with, uh, you know, a game against uh, Campbell where uh, somebody went eight for eight. You know, sure did. Um, the, the situation then we we'd come off a spring break trip and had played, gosh, we because of just they wanted to minimize our travel expenses. We typically played double headers when we went went somewhere. Right. And I think we played seven games in six days and had we didn't have much pitching to begin with. And I, I guess maybe if I could take a step back, just tell you about the team. Right. So I mentioned it came together quickly and there were only a few guys that were actually recruited on the on the team. Uh-huh. We had one scholarship player and he got all of $500. His name was Ricky Saunders. Um, uh, he and I have been, been good friends for many years. We're in each other's wedding. He's in the Radford hall of fame. Um, but, uh, was, was probably our only legitimate division one player. He was, he was a second baseman. Everybody else, we had 25 freshmen who, you know, had never played college baseball. And a lot of them like me were probably just average to good high school players, you know, who would have been, as freshmen would have been marginal division three players and probably struggled to make a division three roster. Um, we did not have a ball field. Um, there was no, no baseball or softball field on the campus at Bradford, that land that's now the Dedman center, right. was all just a prairie and tall, you know, grass and weeds. It was an old railroad yard. And oh. there, I think there was one ball field in town that was at Radford high school. And in the fall, the football team was practicing on it. And then in the spring, you know, the ba- their high school baseball team. So um, we would um, try to take ground balls, you know, on, on grass on campus. And, and you know, that didn't go well. There were a few nets in the gym. We'd, we'd hit soft toss into, saw very little live pitching. Right. No field. You know, outfielders didn't have much chance to, to track fly balls or, you know, or do that. And then I was a pitcher that year. And uh, did not throw off a mound in preseason until the first time I went on the mound in a game. Oh. So we, uh, you know, all imagine that as a pitcher, you know, just throwing off off a flat ground. Right. Um, another big challenge was was our coach. He was a, he was a, a good guy. Um, he they hired him I think because because they could get him on the cheap. I say they uh, the administration because there was not a lot of budget for, right. for the baseball program. Uh, his name was Tim Newman. He was a graduate student in the physical education department. Uh, and I think Tim was 25 years old. Right. He took softball in the Air Force when he was active duty Air Force right. and not know, know a lot about baseball. So there was, you know, nowadays teams, college teams have a hitting coach and pitching coach and video. And I'm amazed at all the analytics, you know, that right. they have these days. Um, we obviously had had none of that. So it was uh, kind of put us even a little more behind the, the eight ball that that season. But we're all happy to be there, you know. The, right. uh, despite the, we probably saw from a record we were four and twenty six. Yeah. Uh, you asked about the the game at Campbell. Um, so we'd come off the spring break trip. Um, played had played seven games in about six days. Pitching was depleted, and we go to Bowie's Creek, North Carolina, to play Campbell, which you know now they're a top twenty five program. <laughs> And they, you know, they play midweek games against Carolina and beat them routinely, um, you know, more often than not. And um, things just got out of hand. I think we brought in a few position players to pitch and we lost the game 38 to nothing, oh. uh, which at the time was an NCAA record. Oh. And uh, an outfielder for Campbell by the name of Henry Rochelle, who was a sophomore for Campbell, 
right. went eight for eight with five home runs against us. Now, wow. why, why we didn't hit him in his eighth at bat, I'll never know. If it, <laughs> on the bat, for God, I would have. But um, And he set an NCAA record for most hits in a game, most total bases, and most home runs with five home runs. Wow. Um, but it was a... So we, it got all kind of negative attention. It ran on the AP wire and newspapers everywhere. Um, I think the, a day later, my father called me in my dorm room and said, Wait, what in the world happened? <laughs> yeah. uh, same thing with friends, you know, old guys I used to play with in high school were like, man, you know, how, how bad right. that are you guys? Yeah, well, I mean, hey, you, you got to play, you got to play division Division one baseball, you know, there and just and just see where the growth of the program. But I know that uh, what after that, uh, where where were your home games? Was your home games at at the high school field then? We played I think it was three home games. We played two at Christiansburg High School, which was about 10 miles down the road. Um, and then one in Withville in a. Um, either a high school or a minor league field. I recall we played Campbell when they came to play us once at home there. So uh, all the, I know uh, of the, of the games, let's see, 30 of our, 31 of our 34 games, I think it adds up we're, we're on the road. And um, it, it was funny, Mark, I'll, I'll just share with you real, real quick. We, um, so the, a lot of us really didn't know what to expect. You know, we didn't know what division one baseball was like, you know, right. back then, you and as a high school, high school kids now are around Division One ball a lot. Maybe they go to games or go to camps. Right. Um, but we were kind of going into it blind. Uh, first game of the season, we went and played Emory and Henry, which was a Division One three school or Division Three school uh, in the ODAC, and um, was not one of the better teams in the ODAC back then. And we split a doubleheader with them, and huh. really matched up with them well. So, yeah, the ride back, we're thinking, man, you know, this, this is going to be all right. Maybe we can even go 500, okay? Um, two days later, we go to Liberty University in Lynchburg. Right. Like, you know, Liberty was a, a stout program, you know, back then as they are now. You know, nowadays they're in and out of the top 25. Um, they, they were coached by a guy named um, uh, Al Worthington, who pitched in the World Series with the Twins. And um, – so we uh, that game they happened to pitch guy against this name Randy Tomlin who later pitched in the World Series with the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, right. real good left hander. And um, so up to that game, I I had not played at all. Um, the you know hadn't hadn't pitched. Um, so uh, you know my my strategy was you know just like I mean you mentioned other sports I I played a year of football and um, you know wasn't a starter and. Uh, the thing I always did was kind of follow the coach around down the sideline. So if he wanted to put someone in, he'd turn around and I'd be the first person. He'd see. <laughs> right. I did the same thing. I was probably going to be our, our first reliever out of the bullpen. And uh, our starter was a guy named Bill Parks and he starts the game. He's getting, getting shelled. And uh, so finally somebody hits a line drive at him and hits him in the hits. I think it hit him in the knee and then bounced up and brick shade off his face. Trainer goes out and he he's heard and, Sure enough, the coach turns around to look for a pitcher. I'm the first one he sees. Right. You know, back then we you didn't put pitchers in the bullpen. They had bullpens, but you know, the pitchers were in the dugout at the beginning of the game. So he says, Ron, go warm up. So I go running down to the bullpen. You know, my heart's beating a mile a minute. And I look around and there's no catcher. The catcher didn't come out with me. I'm, I'm waving back. Come warm me up. So uh, I have about 10 minutes to warm up, go out. And I think the, the first three pitches I threw, you know, it's like bing, bang, bong, just balls all over. Um, they scored, I think, probably four runs in about five pitches. And the coach comes out to talk to me. Our catcher comes out. He's and he says to our catcher, Chris Flanagan, he says, uh, um, how do his pitches look? And Chris says, I don't know. I haven't caught one yet. <laughs> but uh, but that, that was our introduction to to Division One baseball, and we lost a doubleheader, twenty-one to nothing, and twenty-eight to three. Oh um, wow! Yeah, uh, yeah, I saw that Tim Newman lasted that one year, and then Denny Gregg uh, came in for a couple years before uh, the guy that uh, Denny um, Denny Van Pelt uh, played for, you know, came in and and uh, led the team for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Tim Newman, as it was, was kind of just a sacrificial lamb that, that first year. 
Um, and uh, Greg Denny was he was an assistant AD at Radford, and they put him in charge of the baseball program. He, he was a great guy. You know, probably I think he'd be the first to tell you. Probably not a baseball guy, but but he did a, did a good job and program built up. He did some recruiting, and then uh, it would have been 1988, which was my senior year at Radford. Um, uh, Scott Gines was an assistant coach at UVA. He had played right. at, played at VMI and right. uh, was at UVA. I, I think he had a PhD actually in sports psychology, but just uh-huh. a super sharp, super intense guy. Um, but Rev was able to hire him, and it was really when he turned the program around. In fact, the first two guys he recruited were out of Lynchburg. A pitcher you might have heard of by the name of Phil Leftwich. Yes. Uh, was like drafted drafted in the high rounds uh, or the low rounds by the Angels, pitching the major league for major leagues for three seasons with the Angels, mm-hmm. and uh, a catcher by the name of Travis Morgan, who was also from that area. Who you know how he got him away from schools like UVA or Tech? I don't know, but right. um, but those were two guys that really put put Radford on the map. And by about eighty nine or ninety, you know they were. It wasn't unusual for Radford to beat. Uh, UVA or Tech or VCU in a midweek game, especially right. through if you know they threw Phil Leftwich, right? Uh, so uh, yeah, that un, under Scott Gines and and then I think uh, Denny Van Pelt came along a few years later. Uh, right. He was a real good hit in first baseman. He played football at University of Kansas for a year and decided he wanted to play baseball when he when he came to Radford. Right now, during your years, did you guys end up having? A, field, a home field on campus before you graduated or was it or with it just being in the beginning stages at that time, do you still uh, play home games at area high schools? Yeah, they for the first two years um, and the, the only year I played was 80 was 85 and in 86. Oh. They've done some done some recruiting and uh, I, I, I did, did not make the team after that. Um, which was was uh, was fair fair enough, I think. Um, but um, they played at Calfee Park in uh, Pulaski, which is a, it was a rookie league team at the time. I think right. for the Braves or the Yankees. It's now a college summer league stadium. Um, and then in about eighty seven or eighty eight was when they they built. Uh, it wasn't a stadium when they first built it. It was more just a ball field. And right. then over the years did some enhancement to the. You know now I have a really really nice Division One stadium there at, at the the Dedman Center. So that okay. came along in 87 or 88. Okay. 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 So the baseball team from the late 80s has pretty much been at the same same place just over the years with fundraising and everything. Ended up doing some enhancement. And I think, you know, got the names here to sponsor the field here, uh, you know, uh, a few years back. I think that's that's the way it came along. Yeah, it's been a been a steady improvement to to that field. And uh, is is uh, Alex Square and those guys? They've got a got a great facility now, and and I, I enjoy going there to see it. Right. Yeah. And then uh, you know, um, when did you uh, start uh, becoming an author? Well, I uh, you know w- once I was through playing baseball, uh, I had uh, was a journalism major at Radford, okay. and. Uh, had along about my my sophomore junior year had an opportunity to write for this for the university newspaper, and and did that. So I, I then turned to covering the baseball team, and right. so you know that, that was good. Uh, covered covered the basketball team as a sports writer, and then would also write some articles that landed in the some of the local newspapers there. You know when they wouldn't have reporters to to attend the game, and uh, then was the sports editor my senior year at Radford of the the university newspaper. And worked in sports information at Radford, which did a lot of publicity and and right. promoted sports. Um, and then that was where I got to know Mike Ashley. He yeah. was probably one of my first my first mentors, um, Mike Ashley, who later became sports information director at Radford. And you know, was probably more than anybody, just uh, probably the best publicist Radford's ever had, and just you know, an ambassador for for Radford athletics and for the school. But um, so I, I started writing actually in, in college. And um, then uh, uh, when I left for Africa, it was time to get a job. I, I worked for a period of time uh, as a writer, um, mm-hmm. uh, either freelance writing or, or covering, um, uh, you know, covering sporting events. It's a stringer, if you've ever, you know, ever heard that term. 
And right. then I uh, realized in a, in a newspaper environment, I saw the the guys that were driving the nice cars and wearing the nice suits were selling <laughs> advertising. They weren't writers. And <laughs> decided I wanted to do that and then worked worked uh, in advertising, actually, and later on worked in television advertising here in Hampton Roads okay. and, um, for probably the, the majority of my career. And uh, but the whole time was doing some writing, was doing copywriting and, you know, a lot of the the television ad campaigns that maybe you've seen on on TV in Hampton Roads, you know, did some of the writing with with that. And uh, about the time I turned 50, I decided I, I wanted to write a book that I'm 58 now. So that was eight years ago. And, you know, any any writer, your goal is, you know, typically maybe a bucket list thing to to have a book published. All right. Uh, and um, started writing a, a baseball book. And, and some of it was was actually based on that 85 season kind of yeah. uh, I, I envision it as like Bull Durham meets Animal House. Right. <laughs> um, it, was, it, was, it had some humorous stories and some pranks we played and just some of the funny things that happen in the course of a baseball season, especially a season like that. <laughs> and um, then tried to get that book published and uh, didn't have any publishers interested in it and had a literary agent in Richmond, actually, who told me, you know, listen, there's a very thin market for that book, um, right. meaning that there's not a big audience for it. Um, you know, she told me you're you're a pretty good writer, you know, certainly good enough to be published, but you've got to write about something in a different genre. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I asked her, you know, well, what's a popular genre? And uh, she said true crime, which, oh. you know, as you know, and, and this was about six years ago. But as you know, now, true crime, there's all kind of documentaries. Right. You know, United is Dateline on NBC. Right. Um, People, you know, my, my wife and so many other people I know listen to true crime podcasts a lot. Um, and then I knew exactly what I was going to write about in, in the true crime space. Um, there was um, about five years before I got to Radford, there was a murder case that happened in that area. And it was really unique because it was the first nobody murder case in the history of Virginia. And oh. what that means um just to tell you the, the story, a, uh, there was a student, uh, she was actually a student at Radford University uh, named Gina Hall, who had disappeared. She went to a nightclub at Virginia Tech uh, to go dancing on June 28, 1980, and um, she disappeared. She was never seen again. Uh, there was an investigation and um, uh, realized that she had last been seen uh, or accounted for with a former Virginia Tech football player by the name of Steve Epperly. Um, this story was in the news back then, and there were all kind of rumors about it on campus. Um, so she was never found, despite this massive search for her. You know, they, the investigators came to believe that she was murdered. And um, the person I just mentioned, Steve Epperly, was put on trial for her murder in 1980. And it was the first time in Virginia someone was convicted of murder without uh, the victim's body. Um, just gave away the book, gave away the ending there. So, uh, so I, I, I feel like I've always had a good nose for a good story. You know, part right. of that, just having a background in journalism. And I knew that if I could interview the people that were involved in that case, that, you know, it, it would make a great, very compelling book. Um, so I went about, you know, I called the, um, the attorney that prosecuted the case, who, who was, was still around, was only in his 60s by, by then, uh, right. the investigator with the Virginia State Police. Uh, I spoke with friends of the the victim, Gina Hall, and also friends of the killer that, that knew him. You know, he was a guy, um, uh, good looking guy, clean cut, but had, you know, a very, very dark, violent, violent background. And um, over the course of about two years, wrote, wrote a book and, and uh, the book was called Under the Trestle. And that's right. a picture of it there. And okay. um, uh, it got the book published and it, and it became a true crime bestseller, sold uh, a lot better than I thought it would. So <laughs> film rights for the book to a film producer, uh, McTavish Pictures and Scott McTavish. And we've been working on that for the last few years, trying to, um, for the documentary to land on a television streaming service, uh, right. hopefully by, by uh, later this year. And okay. uh, so it was a case, you know, like your high school English teacher or college English teacher would tell you, you know, pick a good subject to write about. And I, I you know, think I really did. And then from that, there was another, um, I got to know a lot of um, former, uh, either active or retired law enforcement people, not only at the local level, but 
with the state police and the FBI and the DEA who told me I, I should write about uh, a drug smuggler from back in the 80s who was a pilot. He was this crazy daredevil pilot named Wally Thrasher who yeah. would fly marijuana from uh, Florida and, and Mexico and uh, Belize and um, Central States and into Virginia. Um, right. And he, he did it for the better part of 10 years. And um, then he uh, disappeared. He was believed to have faked a plane crash. And um, a lot of people thought he, you know, when the Federals started looking for him, he just uh, took all the money, the millions that he made and went and, you know, lived somewhere in the in the Caribbean or an island right. in Central America. Whether or not that's true, you know, we, we don't know. But anyway, I spent about a year researching that, wrote a book about that that also did well. Oh. And, um uh, sold the film rights to that to a company in California called Urban Legends Film Company, who've done done a lot of documentary style filming for it, and it's still you know still in the works, uh, right. in development uh, for that. And then since then, I've written two other books. Uh, I won't get into detail about that. With another one coming out this spring, uh, was picked up by a, a publisher called Post Hill Press that has distribution with uh, Simon and Schuster, who's one of the major publishers. So. Um, you know, that was a was was a big step forward for my writing there. Um, and now I'm, I'm, you know, pretty much writing a, as an author full time. Right. And uh, I have no shortage of material. I have all kind of people. In fact, just yesterday had someone else. Um, it's interesting. People who work in law enforcement, you know, throughout their career, they have these incredible cases that they work on that they really enjoy talking about. And then, you know, I came along and I'm willing to, to spend the time researching them and writing about it. So. Uh, I've got a, um, you know, a nice uh, bunch of topics and future cases to write about. Just a matter of, you know, of, of getting that done. Right. So, uh, so anyway, that's that's what I do now. I uh, I lecture. Um, a few colleges have used uh, my first book as a textbook uh, for their criminal justice curriculum. Mm -hmm. So uh, I lecture at colleges. Um, I gave a lecture yesterday in in Hampton. Uh, you know, about these cases, kind of trying to weave some of the lessons and things that you can learn about the law or, or just human nature, you know, from from these these cases that I've that I've written about. So it's uh, popular material. You know, as I said, true crime is incredibly popular and uh, I've just been been fortunate to have been kind of pointed in that in that direction. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know my wife and I, we definitely uh, got the DVR set for Dayline episodes and then even 2020, you know, they've over the last few years there on Friday nights, they've kind of, you know, uh, shaped their uh, their show to, uh, you know, crime cases. You're exactly right. Uh, it, it's uh, it's it's so popular. And even uh, Oprah Winfrey, you know, who's the, one of the media moguls out there, uh, her network, she owns Oxygen. Um which has been, you know, it used to be like a movie network, like Lifetime. And now, you know, that network focuses almost exclusively on, on true crime. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's big, it's super popular. And, you know, it's, um, I had someone on the marketing end tell me, um, you know, it's popular with both men and women, but the audience skews female. And uh, their theory was, you know, while guys, we like watching sports, you know, true crime to some degree has kind of become a lot of women's genre. You know, it's their their getaway and it's what they enjoy watching and talking about. And, you know, certainly in the case of my books, reading about or listening to podcasts about. Absolutely. Yeah. And what what was let's see. So the first one was under the trestle. What was the name of the second one? Yeah. Uh, the name of the second one is was called Chasing the Squirrel. Um, the, the, and there's the, the cover of that these are all available at Amazon or Barnes and Noble or really wherever books are sold. Um, uh, chasing the squirrel. The name for that comes from this, the drug smuggler I mentioned, his name was Wally Thrasher and, uh, he was super elusive. The authorities just could not catch this guy. As I mentioned, he was a daredevil pilot and his name was the squirrel, um, right. because he was, he was so elusive. So that's, uh, where the title came from. And uh, then the third book I wrote, um, I came in contact with a retired uh, Hampton, Virginia police officer who um, had worked this this very interesting series of, of 
murders back in the 70s and 80s um, that uh, he was convinced there was a serial killer uh, back then and um, began really digging into one of the murders in 2011, 30 years after it happened. Uh, so it was a typical, you know, very old, very cold case. And uh, he was a you know, super smart and creative detective and um, managed to identify a suspect from those murders from 30 years earlier in Hampton, uh, mm -hmm. who still lived in Hampton, was in his 60s, and then tried to build a case against him. And uh, ran into some challenges. The Hampton prosecutor did not want to prosecute the case because it was so old and just, I think, also for political reasons. So I worked with the state prosecutor. Uh, the detective's name was Randy Mayer. Um, he's now retired, lives and works in Alaska. Um, he got the help of a prosecutor out of the state attorney general's office named Phil Figura, who I've gotten to know well and actually I'm working with on another book. And uh, Phil was this really just tough, badass prosecutor um, who would prosecute cases that local prosecutors were scared to. And uh, so he came to Hampton and uh, prosecuted this case, did an incredible job. I won't tell you how it ended. Right. And they also got the assistance of an FBI agent from uh, Hampton Roads here uh, named Liza Ludovico, who one of her specialties was uh, serial killers. And I was provided all the case file information and some of the the suspect interviews that she did that I was able to incorporate into the book. Um, so she was provided assistance in that case. So you had, uh, it was really interesting. And, you know, the reason some of the uh, college criminal justice curriculum uh, programs are into it where I've lectured is, you know, you had a, uh, had a local municipality detective in Hampton and a state level prosecutor, and then a federal in investigator FBI agent um, who yeah. all came together to, to solve this, this, you know, fascinating case. Um, Liza Ludovico, by the way, not to get too far in the true crime rabbit hole here. Right. But, um, uh, she's the, the FBI agent who is the lead investigator on the colonial parkway murders um, mm, yeah. was in the news, you know, big news here in Hampton roads that they uh, identified the person they think is the killer in at least one, probably more of those murders. He's unfortunately deceased, but um She's the one who has done and continues to do a lot of work on on that case. Okay, well, uh, hey, Ron, I'm you know appreciate your time and and um, I know with uh, you know you being part of uh, Radford's first team and you know I'm sure you know seeing where uh, Joe led the team there 2015 and 2017 there to. You know, in 15, they won the regular season. They won the tournament. 2017, they won the Big South tournament. So to see the uh, program, you know, go to the uh, NCAA regionals, you know, definitely uh, great to see with you being an alum. Well, well, thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's still amazing to me to see how far the programs come. You know, I probably as, as much as anyone, you know, I've seen it from from day one. Right. And made a point at least every few years, you know, to, to get back and see a game or to see them at the road on the road when they play ODU or William and Mary here in Hampton Roads has right. been uh, been pretty neat. And then you mentioned 2015, you know, I'd be remiss. I, I mentioned Alex Guerra, who's the head coach now. But, um, you know, the job Joe Rakuya did as head coach, just building the program then to, to um play so well to make a regional and then play in a regional final like they did in 2015 against Vanderbilt was just, just incredible. And I, I want to say, you know, one thing that about our 1985 team that really um, I, I think is really touching to me is that uh, there were five guys on that team who went on to be uh, high school baseball head coaches, um, mm. which is, is pretty neat around the state. And then two guys that are now athletic directors at the at the high school level. Right. Right. A guy named Mark, Mark Settle in the um, uh, Northern Virginia area, and then a guy named Tony Nicely, who's at a Richmond high school that slips my mind. But um, so it was a, even though we didn't do well on the on the uh, the ball field, you know, some some guys that really really went on to great things and can, have continued to help grow the game and certainly grow you know high school athletics. Right and. Uh, Hey, I mean, with uh, next spring being uh, 2025, I mean, it's, uh, you know, 40, 
40 years there for the 40th anniversary there of the uh, first team. Yeah, 40 years. Where where did it go? That's right. going fast. Well, hey, I uh, certainly appreciate your time. Sorry for uh, going a little bit over, but I know that we uh, definitely had a lot to talk about. So uh, appreciate your time here to talk about, uh, you know, Ferrum and then on to Radford and your journalism career and then, um, you know, uh, your uh, author uh, career there with uh, publishing a couple books and then a couple more there in the in the work. So uh, thanks again for your time. Well, thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. And keep up, keep up the great work. I love, love the, uh, the, the work you do. All right. Appreciate it. And uh, all right, fans, uh, that's uh, Ron Peterson Jr. here today. So uh, thanks again.